Hi, welcome. Thank you all for joining us this cold afternoon. Uh, I am Adam Roffer. I'm the director of the Center for Judaic Studies on behalf of the University of Denver. I want to thank you all for coming and for being here for this very, very important event. I also want to draw your attention. There were some uh, unpaid child labor. Can I say that? <laughs> Uh, they were going around handing out flyers for the Marcus Lecture. That is a lecture on Holocaust history and memory. We have an Oscar-nominated Israeli director coming in on the 9th of November. I hope all of you will attend or consider attending. It's going to be an excellent screening. It's going to be the first screening in the U.S. and he's going to be present live and in person on stage. I also want to take a moment to introduce and acknowledge Diane Yuboa, who is the founder, artistic director, and the driving force behind this program and theater order. And when I say driving force, I do mean a force and a force for good. So Diane, please take it over. We had over 180 people registered for this today. I think the weather scared some people away. I think they're all going to miss a very interesting afternoon. I want to take just a moment to thank all of our sponsors. And if you look up there, we have a lot of sponsors for this program, and many of them are also sponsors of the production itself. And I have to give a, a special shout out to the Center for Judaic Studies, to Adam, to Selena Noma, and to Ingrid Weyer, who have done so much. You can't imagine how much work goes to into an event like this, including these beautiful programs they completely did on their own, and these slides that we're seeing there. A couple of other announcements. For any students in the audience today, I have written a grant, and there is going to be a performance for free tickets for students, December 2nd at 10.30, if you are free and available. Email Theater Or is on the card, and I will put you down for a free ticket to the show Sisters in Law. The other thing I want to say is this forum has been awarded one CLE credit for continuing legal education for attorneys. We're going to apply for the play for credit too. We'll see how that goes. And then um, for questions, there are little cards and pencils that were handed out. If at any time you have a question, please just write it down and raise your hand and the monitor will come pick it up and give it to our moderator, Catherine Starnella, who is the president of the Women's Bar Association here in Colorado. And I'm going to turn this forum now over to her and she will introduce our other guest panelists and you can read all about them in the program as well. So thank you so much for coming and get ready for action. Uh, so welcome everybody, it's so good to see all of you here and we definitely have an exciting conversation planned for you. The panel discussion part will be about an hour and then we will have 15 minutes at the end for our Q&A. And so to introduce our esteemed panelists, to start off at the very end over there going in alphabetical order, we have uh, DU Law Professor Rebecca Aviel and she is a graduate of Yale College and Harvard Law School. She clerked for Judge Barry Silverman in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and she also practiced litigation at a big law firm in San Francisco called Morrison Forster. I'm not gonna go into all the details of her bio or of the other panelists' bios. As Diane said, you all have a program with more information about our panelists. But to highlight Professor Aviel's work, her research and teaching interests include family law, the legal profession and professional responsibility, and constitutional law. To her right, we have Professor Sarah Chatfield. She's at University of Denver. She's a political science professor. She received her PhD from UC Berkeley, and she did postdoc research at MIT. She teaches classes in American politics and law, and her areas of research are particularly fascinating for today's conversation. They include the development of married women's economic rights in the 1800s, and she does have a forthcoming book, so keep your eyes open for that. 
She also does research on the politics of bathroom access in the United States and the role of gender in campaign staff hiring. And to my immediate left, we have Attorney General Phil Weiser. He is Colorado's 39th Attorney General, as well as my boss at the AG's office. <laughs> and he is the state's chief legal officer. He has dedicated his life and career to public service, law, and justice. Before running for office, he was a professor of law and the dean at University, University of um, Colorado. And he served in the U.S. Department of Justice under both uh, the Obama and Clinton administrations. And he was also a senior advisor for technology and innovation. And really, you know, interesting for today's conversation, he clerked for Justices Ginsburg and, uh, and White, so Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Byron White, as well as Judge David Ebell in the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals. So, <coughs> certainly welcome to our esteemed panelists, and without further ado, we will jump into the conversation. So to start off, I'm gonna start off with Professor Chatfield in the middle, and certainly I think many of us are aware that public confidence in the Supreme Court has declined, and a recent Gallup poll shows that only 47% of Americans have a great deal of trust and confidence in the judicial department as it's headed by the Supreme Court. And that is a 20% percentage point drop from just two years ago. And 58% of Americans polled disapprove of the Supreme Court. So as a result, many people believe that the court has lost its legitimacy. So therefore, Professor Chatfield, drawing on your scholarship as a political science professor, how has the country's and the public's perception of the court's legitimacy changed over the course of our country's history? So we have, uh, thank you so much. Um, and uh, so far, as far back as we have pulling data on this, this goes back to about the 1970s. Um, and uh, based on that polling data, yes, confidence and legitimacy are at an all-time low. Um, I do think it's important to note our country goes much farther back than the 1970s, and we might not have polling to show, but I think you could look at examples like the Civil War period. Um, during the war, President Lincoln ignored pro-South decisions by a conservative Supreme Court, worked with Congress to recall the federal court system and add justices to the Supreme Court. So this isn't the first time um, that there were conflicts between what the court was doing and um, the public or the elected branches. Thank you for that. And I guess, um, how has the court's decision making fostered its legitimacy or detracted from it? So when I teach classes on constitutional law or judicial politics, I would traditionally, um, maybe prior to the past year, um, say uh, the court needs to care about legitimacy because, as Alexander Hamilton said, it has neither purse nor sword. The political branches theoretically wield a lot of power over the courts, um, and if it makes a lot of unpopular decisions, people might just start ignoring the courts, and there's nothing it can really do about that. So that's not really what we're seeing in recent months. <laughs> Um, and I had a really interesting conversation about this with um, some of my colleagues in political science um, about why that um, might have broken down. We see a few things happening. Um, I think one is the appointment of more justices who may care less about broad public legitimacy because they're enmeshed in this intellectual community, specifically the conservative federalist society, and conservative justices may care more about their legitimacy within that community, which is way up, right? Um, as opposed to the broader um, public. Um, another thing going on is that justices know that Congress is extremely polarized, and so the likelihood of Congress being able to punish them is very low as a result. And then finally, I just want to mention for issues like abortion in particular, where a conservative ruling returns power to the states, the structure of that ruling makes the court's lack of enforcement power less crucial. Um, right, a conservative state wants to limit abortion rights, so it's happy, it wants to enforce that um, ruling. A state like Colorado can keep um, laws that protect religious, uh, religious <laughs> reproductive rights, um, but of course it can't force other states to do the same. Um, and that's a really different structure than something like Brown v. Board, where state and local governments opposed to desegregation could do a lot to ignore that ruling. 
and keep segregated schools. Um, so abortion and a lot of kind of similar issues that a conservative court might rule on, like same-sex marriage, um, have a really different policy structure um, that makes this lack of enforcement power from the court less relevant. Thank you for that. And continuing along the lines of the court's decision making, I'd now like to turn to A.G. Weiser. Um, and you know, in terms of Justice O'Connor's decision making, many biographers have commented that you know she her, commented about her empathy, and you know she would listen to people, and she would care about how decisions impact people, and she would take interest in their lives. And so, therefore, to what extent should judges be mindful of public sentiment on issues when uh, they're considering, or and, and to what extent should they consider the real world consequences of their decisions? Thank you all for being here. This is an exceptional performance, and it highlights something so relevant as the questions I underscore. Justice O'Connor was the last member of the Supreme Court to run for political office. For many people who are used to the idea that you nominate someone to be a justice who is a judge, that might be striking. But if you look back in the sweep of history, many of our greatest jurists ran for political office. I would submit having now done this. Running for political office, having an accountability to voters, sensitizes you that maybe those in every tower might like. It is a healthy thing to answer your question for a jurist to ask the question, what are the practical consequences of the ruling? And you're right, O'Connor thought long and hard about it. I also work for another jurist, Byron White, who is a Supreme Court Justice, who also thought long and hard. And I work for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who thought long and hard about the facts in the case. It is a problem if you have judges who are driven, let's call it, through an ideological or philosophical lens towards the result and aren't constrained, aren't reflective what will this mean in practice, including, as you noted, the public's view of the court as an institution? This summer, Justice Kagan actually talked out loud about her concern that a Supreme Court that acts in ways that are at odds with what the public wants is engaging in what could be a dangerous or fraught enterprise. Thank you. And in terms of jurist concerns about the impact of their decisions. Like how has that manifested it itself, either in the Supreme Court decisions or other courts' decisions? It's going to be hard today not to talk about the Dobbs decision, because it's on our minds. And what is painful about that decision in this respect, there's many painful elements, but one is the impact of pregnant women is not something that gets a lot of discussion. When you read Roe versus Wade, one of the unfortunate elements, the decision talks a lot about doctors. It's, it's like the doctors are the central characters, which is in part because Harry Blackman had been the general counsel to the Mayo Clinic. So that was his view of the world. I do believe it's unfortunate that both the majority and the Senate opinions lack women at the center. Justice Ginsburg had a powerful exchange in her confirmation hearings. She said, not allowing women to control their reproductive health care systems, denying them the choice to have access to abortion care, puts them unequal to men. The edgy way to put it is, if men had to bear children, they wouldn't tolerate not having control of reproductive health care systems, women shouldn't either. Mm -hmm. And that equality element, that practical consequence, was ignored in the decision. You know what else was? The health impacts of people who might have, you heard about ectopic pregnancies or abortion miscarriages, abortion care as health care also didn't get enough honest discussion. And then what Roberts in his dissent highlighted was the case went well beyond the facts of the case. People forget this was a Missouri law which was going to limit access to abortion care after 12 weeks. But the Supreme Court said we're going to allow limits of any kind, at any time, with no facts in the, the lawyers would call, instant case that could justify that decision. And Robert said, why are you doing it? 
we're getting way outside of uh, way out front of our headlights. When the Supreme Court acts out front of its headlights, when it doesn't know the consequences of the decision, it's in dangerous waters. And the Dobbs decision is dangerous waters. It's dangerous. And on top of it, showing sort of the again agenda that's driving it. Justice Thomas writes a concurrence and says, this means that contraceptive services are no longer protected. Marriage equality is no longer protected. And that further erodes the sense that what's happening is judging based on the rule of law and the facts of the case. It makes it look like there's some other project that's being driven in this case. Thank you. And again, you know, sticking with judicial decision making and to your comments about judges getting ahead of the facts that are presented before them, I'd like to turn back to Professor Chatfield. And during our prep session, you mentioned something a doctrine called legal realism. And as I did some research, I realized that the counterpoint to that is legal formalism. And so how do those two, well, if you could explain what those two approaches are and how do they foster or diminish legitimacy? So um, legal formalism would be the idea that judges either do or at least should uh, make rulings in ways that are entirely separate from politics, just applying neutral facts to cases, uh, sorry, neutral principles to the facts of cases. And legal realism, on the other hand, is the idea that we need to study law as it actually occurs in practice, in which judges, of course, are taking into account interests and policy in their decision making. And there's a long intellectual history. I won't get into all the details here, but um, I'll just say, at least from a political science perspective, it's very clear that things like partisanship and ideology heavily influence judicial decision making. And when we look at judges' voting patterns, it's very clear they're not simply applying neutral principles with no influence from political, from politics. And you know whether that's good or bad, that's kind of reality. Um, and. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. Okay, no, and, and I guess if you could talk about, I mean, I think some people might think legal realism touches upon judicial activism. Does it, and if it does, I mean, is that a good thing? It seems like it would be a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 um, I think judicial activism is a funny term. I think mostly people use it to describe judicial decisions I don't like. Um, yeah. If you're conservative, you would say Dobbs is an example of judicial restraint because it's representing the courts getting out of the business of adjudicating state laws on abortion. It lets states just make their own decisions. Um, if you're liberal, you'd say Dobbs is an example of judicial activism because it's overturning decades of precedent and throwing into question any number of other rulings, um, like the Attorney General just mentioned. Um, personally, I, I don't know if it's a super useful analytical tool, just because it mostly means I don't like what the court is doing. Um, but yeah. And because we're also here because of this play about the relationship between Justices O'Connor and Ginsburg, how has the court's decision making changed, if at all, since those two were on the bench? Yeah, um, so one of the main things I would point out is this clear breakdown in collegiality on the court. Despite very strong differences of ideology and opinion, we can look to the fact, um, um, like Ginsburg and Scalia, right? Clearly close friends, clearly had genuine affection for each other that they weren't just like putting on for the media or something, um, even though they disagreed um, on the law very strongly. Um, it's very hard for me to imagine, let's say Samuel Alito and Katanji Brown Jackson having that same sort of friendship. Um, and some of the justices even have public commented publicly on this lack of trust, uh, lack of collegiality on the current court, especially after the Dobbs leak. Um, so I feel like that's one major difference. Thank you. And continuing along with Dobbs, I'd like to turn back to Professor Aviel. What does the post-Dobbs landscape look like? Well, my fellow panelists have already laid groundwork for a variety of critiques that you could level at the Dobbs decision. Among those, perhaps one of the least persuasive aspects of the Dobbs decision is the supposition that it was bringing abortion litigation to an end. This is not the end of abortion litigation, it's just the start of a new chapter. So let me kind of lay the landscape. So, um, abortion is or will soon become illegal in 26 states. And this is a combination of states that had abortion bans still on the books from before Roe versus Wade, states that had trigger laws, so they were poised to go into effect upon Roe being overturned, states like Oklahoma, for example, that just went ahead and enacted a near total abortion ban even before Dobbs, and then of course all of the states that have passed legislation um, this summer since Dobbs. So as of mid-October, um, there are 13 states that have full total bans 
Um, again, just really underscoring the importance of Attorney General Weiser's observation that that wasn't a necessary consequence of the facts that were in front of the court of law. So 13 states with full bans, one state that has a six week ban, another four states that have bans between 15 and 20 weeks. Eight of those have no exceptions for sexual assault or incest. Tennessee at the end of August passed a law that has no exception for the life of the mother. So a doctor that was criminally charged under Tennessee's law would have to raise it affirmatively as a defense in the pendency of a criminal prosecution. And then nine additional states have uh, enacted bans that have been blocked by courts pending legal challenges. And then there are states like Texas that have multiple things going on, um, including something that many of you probably heard about, um, a fetal heartbeat law that was passed in um, August of 2021 that empowers private citizens to um, sue people who are uh, suspected of violating the ban um, and obtain $10,000 in damages. Legislators in Texas are also introducing additional legislation specifically to address things like employers who are reimbursing abortion travel expenses. Um, and so that um, some of these laws that are coming on the books in Texas um, would again allow private citizens to sue anyone, not only who obtained an abortion illegally in Texas, um, but who provide any sort of funding um, to go outside of the Texas to go outside of Texas. So regardless of where the procedure occurs, regardless of the law in the jurisdiction where it occurs. For the law students and, and lawyers among us, one of the things this new law would do is require the state bar of Texas to disbar any lawyer who provides funding or any assistance to someone who um, uh, violates these laws. And then if the state bar were to um, fail to disbar um, the attorney, it, the law would allow any member of the public um, to bring a disbarment action. And so part of the reason that I go into this detail is to share with you that there's not going to be a static post Dobbs landscape. Um, even within the group of, 20, of the 26 states where it's expected to be legal, um, there's just this expansionist quality, right? Um, there's a lack of discernible boundaries on the acceptable targets and instruments of regulation. I mean, mandatory disbarment, your state bar regulatory agencies have not typically been thought of as an instrument to enforce you know, the criminal law. Um, in contrast, abortion will remain legal and um, even protected by state statute or constitutional law, state constitutional law, um, in the remainder, with some of those states really proactively um, seeking to protect their providers. So as many of you know, Governor Paulus and 11 other state governors have signed executive orders um, refusing to extradite. Um, doctors and other people involved in um, providing abortion care. Um, there are a variety of states that have enacted abortion shield laws that would um, protect providers' licenses, um, licenses and, and malpractice insurance. Colorado passed the Reproductive Health Equity Act um, in April of 2022. And so this obviously sets the stage for an extraordinary degree of interstate conflict. Um, that just really outlasts the end of the constitutional right to terminate a pregnancy. And so uh, courts will need to decide what is the extraterritorial reach of state power, right? So maybe I'll pause there. Um, a lot more we could talk about as far as the particular issues that are emerging in this new landscape um, of abortion litigation, but maybe I'll pause there and uh, we can expand on it as um, yeah, and actually, if you wanted to touch on some of those issues now, I mean, those are sure. short time. Sure, so, you know, as a general matter, it's understood that states can't use ordinary criminal laws to prosecute people for crimes committed outside of their borders. Um, but this is just riddled with complications in the abortion context, especially with the advent of telehealth and medication abortion that are presenting issues that just um, were not a part of the landscape um, prior to Roe. Um, and so, you know, some of the questions that um, states and courts will have to answer is, you know, where does an abortion take place, right? If you have a, a practitioner who is providing medical advice and guidance to someone through Zoom or through other you know, virtual technologies, um, so you have the doctor in one place, the patient is in another place, the patient can go to a third location to obtain the medication, and a fourth location, I mean, you know, the medication itself is a two-step sequence, right? Um, and so again, the idea that there's not going to be litigation over all of these sub-issues and sub-sub-issues is unpersuasive. Um, and so, you know... That was an understatement, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, 
you know, so, so these, these questions about extraterritorial state power, right? How much can Texas do to make sure not only that abortions aren't happening within the state of Texas, but that they're you know, kind of reaching beyond their boundaries to make sure that anyone with connection to an employer or a person, you know, I mean, it, it, it sounds far-fetched, and I, I hear myself saying things that sound far-fetched, but, you know, would a, would a Georgia resident say who receives abortion medication by mail at a friend's house, you know, over the border in North Carolina, but returns home and takes, you know, some or all of the medication from the state, be guilty um, of homicide, right? Because the act occurred in Georgia, or you know, etc. So um, the made, uh, the the news from scholars who study these issues uh, most closely um, is that it's really an open question. Um, that we just, the, the, I, in my opinion, the most cur current authoritative pronouncement is that it's an open question whether the Constitution permits states to target abortion travel or abortion related conduct um, that doesn't happen within the prosecuting state's border. So there's the state to state relationship issues that are complex. There's also um, open questions about the, the relationship between the state and the federal government, right? So, um, you know, Article, Article 6 of the Constitution contains the supremacy clause. It sets forth the proposition that federal law is supreme over conflicting state law. Um, and so there are provisions in federal law that arguably constrain what states can do, right? So um, the FDA has approved the drugs that comprise the medication regimen for um, abortion. Does that suggest an intent to displace state laws that would prohibit people from using them? Um, uh, one of these preemption questions that's very live um, is, uh, emerges from a federal statute called the Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act. Um, this requires all hospitals to receive Medicaid um, uh, to follow certain um, <clears throat> procedures about providing emergency medical treatment. And so the Biden administration issued an executive order um, determining that laws should require abortion care where necessary to protect the health and life of a pregnant patient. Um, and Texas has challenged that law, and a federal judge has enjoined the Biden administration from enforcing um, that order. Um, and maybe the last thing that I'll say, I'm conscious of having so many interesting things to talk about, I don't want to monopolize the time, is that, you know, Dawes ended the era in which the right to terminate a pregnancy is protected by the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, but there's still a lot of other constitutional obligations that states have that have not vaporized after Dobbs, including the First Amendment for example, right? Um, so the First Amendment still protects religious exercise. In fact, the protection for religious exercise is ascendant in the Supreme Court. Um, and so there are lawsuits that have been filed um, by Jewish clergy and Muslim clergy who are asserting that in the theological um, guidance that they follow, um, it is mandatory to prioritize the health of the pregnant person um, in cases where that may be in conflict with the you know, um, ongoing pregnancy. Um, and so so there are arguments that there is a First Amendment right to counsel people who might um, you know, be needing to terminate their pregnancy. Speech rights, right? So for one other example is there's a South Carolina law that purports to criminalize maintaining a website or providing information to pregnant people um, about the means to obtain an abortion. I think there are viable free speech challenges that can be brought um, to some of those. Uh, vagueness, right? So you have a due process right not to be governed by laws that are too vague to understand. And um, doctors are objecting that where uh, abortion prohibitions do allow exceptions for a medical emergency, that um, those exceptions are vague and confusing and ambiguous. Fourth Amendment data privacy issues, right? One of the other things that we haven't seen before Roe is the surveillance technology that all of us are subject to on our phone. You know, so that if a pregnant person is searching for information about abortion medication or has a period tracker, all of that could be obtained by a warrant from law enforcement that we're seeking to, um, you know, pursue uh, a possible criminal investigation. Um, maybe even Eighth Amendment issues, right? So the Eighth Amendment protects us from cruel and unusual punishments. It's a very limited doctrine. Um, but again, I don't know that it's entirely far-fetched to imagine a future in which the state passes a law imposing the death penalty for someone guilty of an abortion offense, right? So um, there's a fetal personhood bill introduced in Ohio um, you know, that would say that the state of Ohio shall recognize the personhood of all unborn human individuals from the moment of conception, right? Um, in Texas, also legislators are 
talking about you know the murder of an unborn child. So I, I know it sounds far-fetched. I hear myself saying it, but there may be a future in which the Supreme Court will have to decide whether abortion counts as a homicide, for which states can you know impose the death penalty. So I guess. What I want to suggest in closing um, is you, you might hear conversation about going back or you know, going back to pre There's no resetting of pre roadmap right? Um, you know, including just advances, not only surveillance technology, advances in obstetrics, right? And imaging and endoscopic technology, genetic screening technology, right? Ectopic pregnancies can be diagnosed much earlier and treated more effectively than ever before as some of those treatments um, are likely to implicate the new abortion ban. So there's no going backward in a, um, a really, really unsettled new term. Thank you, and I know there was a lot there, so during the Q&A, there will be an opportunity to drill down on any of that information if you do have follow-up questions. I do want to, was there a question? No? Okay. Um, obviously, these issues really cause, you know, it, a lot of debate in our society and uh, perhaps a decline in civil discourse, and I want to turn to Attorney General Weiser again. And I know you've talked about how you've spoken about how the importance of civil dialogue that it's it's so important to preserving the integrity of our institutions and how a toxic polarization leads to the decline of our institutions. So how as attorney general have you worked to bolster the integrity of our legal institutions? It's really important that people who are serving and have different views are committed to dialogue. It starts with listening. It starts with respect. It includes having friendships with people who may see the world differently. So Wayne Williams is a former Secretary of State. He's from Colorado Springs. He's a member of the Church of Latter Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Very different than I am. We're friends. And we did a program recently with MSU Denver, Gene Davidson, the president moderated and talk about the importance of having friendships, having relationships where you listen. We together did something called the Unified Colorado Challenge, where people were able to participate in a dialogue with someone in a different part of the state with different views. And we did a documentary for that. And you can watch it. Go to our website, and I think it's um, Ginsburg School, yeah, you'll see we put this up, and it's people from different viewpoints have a conversation, look what happens. What happens is people saw they've got a lot in common. And this is a problem right now. Our society is rife with demonization, with polarization, positioning conversations as if they are death matches, the other side being viewed as a mortal enemy, as opposed to. We've got some challenging public policy issues, some of which we can all agree what we should do, and we can work together. Some of which we may have the same goals, but different specific ideas of how we achieve them. And some of which none of us are exactly sure what to do. So more humility, more listening, more intellectual honesty with one another can build more trust in our institutions, in the rule of law, and by contrast, and Justice Ginsburg says before she died, the level of polarization, the level of undermining and demonizing institutions is a threat to the rule of law, is a threat to governance itself. When you think about the US Constitution, it's premised on the idea that we can have principled compromise. People can actually work together resolve issues, and then come back and have more discussions another day. But if instead we are paralyzed by this idea that if a Democrat proposes something, it must be a bad idea. If a Republican proposes something, it must be a bad idea. We're not going to have public policy making. And I'll tell you, in Washington, D.C. right now, that dynamic of hyperpolarization is a real threat. In Colorado, by contrast, we have continued to have a system of governance that is not undermined and really rendered dysfunctional by polarization. We need to hold on to what we have in Colorado. We need to develop it and bring it back to Washington, D.C. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Thank you. And, and continuing along the point about bridging the ideological divide, I mean, as a former law clerk for Justice Ginsburg, you had a front row seat to how she did that. And at the time of her death, you wrote an opinion piece in the Colorado Sun, and you said, quote, Justice Ginsburg lived her core belief that law is a tool to promote justice. In her view, when cases are developed appropriately, judges can interpret clauses of the Constitution based on the highest ideals of its framers, even if those framers fail to live up to those ideals. So from your perspective, when you were clerking for her, how did she use that approach to bridge that ideological divide with her colleagues, including those who perhaps had an originalist interpretation to the Constitution? The case I want to start with is the case involving Virginia Military Institute. It did not allow women. In that case, the Supreme Court had to consider whether the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution in the 14th Amendment was violated. Justice Ginsburg, citing a prior opinion from Justice O'Connor, said in order to justify a distinction between what men and women can do based on gender, you needed an exceedingly persuasive justification. In her view, VMI failed to offer such a justification and wrote the majority opinion invalidating the law. There was one dissenter, Justice Scalia. Justice Scalia said it should be up to the democratic process to address this issue, and that judges need to be humble and careful when they intervene. Justice Rehnquist, who previously had said to Justice Ginsburg during an oral argument in the 1970s, when she was pushing for gender equality, you mean you're not just going to accept Susan B. Anthony on the dollar coin? <laughs> Justice Rehnquist joined the VMI opinion. Justice Ginsburg would say that her chief, which is, is Chief Justice Rehnquist, really evolved because he had a daughter who became a lawyer, giving him more empathy. Justice O'Connor was with Justice Ginsburg in this case. She had written a previous decision that was relied on having involved in a nursing college in Mississippi that it didn't allow men into it, and that was invalidated as a violation of the protection clause. Now, what's worth noting, equal protection clause adopted in 1868. Catherine is at least converted to this debate about originalism. Originalism is a doctrine that would say, if the Equal Protection Clause in 1868, when it was adopted, wouldn't protect the right of women to access education on an equal basis, then we shouldn't interpret it in 1996, as so. That was Justice Scalia's view. At the time of VMI, he was alone in the view. Justice Thomas was accused because his son was at VMI. So you can call a 17 decision if you think Thomas would have been excluded, which is a fair bet. We've come a long way since then. The Dobbs decision says if it wasn't protected under the Equal Protection Clause in 1868, we don't protect it today. I have to say, I disagree with that version of originalism. Let me explain to you what it means back to practical consequences. You know what wasn't protected in 1868? Integrated schools. Interracial marriage. Not to mention marriage equality, equal access to education opportunity for women, women serving on juries. <coughs> what Justice Ginsburg believed, and what I believe, is the Equal Protection Clause should be interpreted based on the broad aspirations of the framers as to how they would want us to advance equality, not to be limited by the specific conceptions they held at the time based on what they knew then. It is a radical, and it is a disruptive, and it is a novel experiment to apply original, originalism in the form the Dobbs decision would call on us to apply. I predict that radical and novel experiment will fail because it will be unsustainable, untenable, and unacceptable to the American people. So despite the Dobbs decision, is there any current justice on the Supreme Court who's applying an inter interpretation of the Constitution in a way that Justice Ginsburg did? 
We had a recent case involving the Voting Rights Act before the Supreme Court, and the newest Justice Jackson was pushing hard on what you might call the aspirational views of the framers. And this is an important point, and this was hit really nicely by Brandeis. The First Amendment calls for freedom of speech. It's a majestic concept. The framers of that amendment passed what was called the Alien and Sedition Act, which made it a crime to engage in political speech. One can say, I am originalist. I'm going to interpret the First Amendment based on what the framers thought and did at the time, which was a pretty limited view of free speech if you can be criminalized for political speech. Alternatively, you can say, no, I'm not going to take that view. I'm going to take a view that they were committed to a broad concept that even if they fail to apply it themselves, I'm still going to commit to that broad concept of a robust conception of protecting political speech, which is what Brandeis said. He refused to be limited by the Yale Decision Act. Similarly, Justice Jackson would say, we're, we should limit the protection clause by what people at the time thought. People at the time thought it was okay to have segregated schools, to ban interracial marriage. But the purpose was to advance equality for everyone, particularly the freed slaves. And so when you think about voting rights and the risk now of undermining the right of people's voices to be heard because of their race, she says, we should not take a view, which is now being pushed by some, that any race conscious decisions in districting would violate the protection law. She said that's not the aspiration they had. They had to advance equality knowing that we came from a world of discrimination. That is similar to what Justice Ginsburg said in another case involving the Voting Rights Act. Throwing out the pre-clearance procedure, to her mind, was crazy because it was like throwing out your umbrella in a rainstorm saying, I'm not going <laughs> to. Thank you. So, uh, drawing on your reference to the race conscious decisions, uh, with the Supreme Court term having started earlier this year, certainly the issue of affirmative action in schools is on the court's docket. I turn back to Professor Sheffield and Aviel to talk about some of the cases that are on the court's docket and um, how they anticipate uh, perhaps uh, the newest justice will, uh, uh, Justice Kentanji Brown Jackson will approach those decisions. Um, yeah, so yeah, I can start with the um, affirmative action case um, since we were just talking about that one. This is Students for Fair Admissions, um, and there's two cases. Um, one uh, versus Harvard, which Justice Jackson will not be participating in um, because she was recently on their board of overseers and they split them up. There's another one involving the University of North Carolina, um, and they'll hold separate um, arguments so that she can participate in the North Carolina case. Um, but um, this is also an interesting one to me um, because it deals with whether or not the court is going to overturn a 2003 decision, Gregor v. Bollinger, that allows um, universities to use race and admissions processes as part of efforts to achieve diversity on campus. Um, but in that decision, Justice O'Connor um, sort of posited that, well, 25 years from now, we won't need to have affirmative action anymore. Um, it's not no longer going to be necessary um, because society will have advanced. Um, we're 19 years after the Grutter case. I don't know if we have only six more years left to the end of racism, although it's lovely. Um, but, um, but yeah, um, I, it's um, going to be an interesting um, case to kind of see um, what happens here. I think um, if we try to predict um, sort of what's going on, I would imagine the court is going to um, strike down uh, firm action policies uh, with a conservative majority, um, just based on the turnover on the court. Um, since the Grutter decision, um, none of the five justices in the majority from Grutter remain um, on the court. Um, two of them have been replaced by much more conservative um, justices. Mm -hmm. um, so if I had to make a call, that's how I would call in that case, but um, obviously I'll have to wait and see. Um, I'm happy to chat more. Do you want to talk about that case or another case? Sure, so that's definitely a notable one to be argued on Monday. Um, if anyone's uh, wanting to track the oral arguments, um, I would uh, agree with everything Professor Chappell said. I also wanted to really um, endorse and emphasize
emphasize the importance of paying attention to the Supreme Court's voting rights and election law cases. Um, another thing in the Dawes opinion that I uh, would invite everyone to scrutinize and critique is the idea that the court was returning these issues to the people. Um, and um, sort of emphasizing the court's role as a counter-majoritarian institution in contrast to our thriving, robust, democratically accountable institutions. Well, that rhetoric only works if voting and elections are protected and are thriving and are functioning. And when we look at some of the court's handiwork, including in Shelby versus Holder, um, where the Supreme Court eliminated the uh, preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act, if you look at some of the cases in the current term um, involving um, the uh, vote dilution um, uh, consequences of Alabama's um, redistricting maps, uh, the independent state legislature doctrine. So a lot of what the court has done, refusing to, in a case called Rucho versus Common Cause, refusing to um, consider whether extreme partisan gerrymandering violates the Constitution, right? In other words, if you're interested in reproductive rights, or if you're interested in climate change, or if you're interested in literally anything else, Right, the place to really dig down is, you know, what are our institutions, including the Supreme Court, but also our state law institutions doing to protect access to the ballot and to draw our maps in a way where our votes count and we have a meaningful opportunity to be heard in the democratic process. Um, so I, I really, you know, want to endorse my fellow panelists' um, uh, invitation to bring all of this into the same frame. Um, so Merrill versus Milligan is a case involving a challenge to Alabama's um, uh, redistricting. Um, Moore versus Harper um, is a case um, that in which the Supreme Court will consider whether state legislatures have a virtually unreviewable authority over um, federal elections um, that the state courts cannot. Uh, review the work product of state legislators to make sure that it's compliant with state constitutional pro uh, provisions. So a couple of really important election law voting rights cases um, to watch. Um, one of the kind of through lines that you see across these cases, including another one that I'll mention, um, is this is the ascendance of a commitment to color blindness. Right? This idea that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment requires an absolute disregard or um, disuse of racial classification. So it's true in the affirmative action case, it's true in the redistricting case. Um, another notable case this uh, term is called Burkean versus Palin. So um, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals invalidated a portion of the Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, which uh, provides placement priorities for Indian children in part as a response to um, a, a really, really horrible history of removing Indian children from their homes. Um, so the Fifth Circuit had ruled that portions of the ICWA um, are outside of Congress's power and also um, violate protection um, on the theory that the designation of a child in Indian um, is a racial classification that's subject to strict scrutiny. Um, which would, you know, take us in a radically new direction. Um, tribal designations have been thought of as political classifications that stem from the federal government's unique duty of trust um, towards Indian tribes uh, rather than racial classifications. So if you, you know, start to draw the frame outwards, you can see that, you know, there's this um, insistence on um, color blindness or race blindness um, in ways that would really limit the opportunity of state and federal lawmakers to, and, and educational institutions to maintain a cognizance of you know, past you know, histories and ongoing um, uh, conditions of um, discrimination. And I think this is an interesting place to talk about originalism. And um, you know, one of the things that Justice Jackson was doing pretty effectively in the oral argument on the Million case was to you know, use the originalist methodology for progressive ends. You know, so she was kind of playing the game as well and saying there's you know no evidence that the drafters of the 14th Amendment um, expected that the Equal Protection Guarantee would require you know, color blindness. I would also end with the words of um, Justice Brennan, um, who was serving on the court, was also pretty effective in um, uh, providing a counterpoint to the idea of um, you know commitment to originalism and the way that he put it was that the original intent was that the meeting would change. <laughs> that, 
is that the, the drafters deliberately use capacious, abstract, aspirational language to leave us in succeeding generations the um, opportunity and the responsibility to interpret the language in ways that like kind of catch up um, with our lived experience. Okay, I'll yes. So a couple of things. One is, Chief Justice Marshall had a great phrase, which is, we must never forget it's the Constitution that we're interpreting meant to go on for ages to come. And this idea of this rigid, fixed in time, I mentioned before, it's unsustainable. Let me go back and explain a little bit. Justice Kavanaugh, reading Justice Thomas's concurrence, was scared. Because he basically said, wait a minute, if we follow through on that project, I don't think the public's view of us is going to essentially um, come out in either place. So he tried to say, don't worry, we're not going after marriage equality or access to contraceptive services. Justice Kavanaugh has a problem. If he's committed to the originalist methodology, how does he make the distinction that abortion rights weren't protected in 1868, contraceptive rights weren't protected by how does he draw that distinction while being an originalist? Mm -hmm. Justice Scalia famously used a line. He said, well, I'm a faint-hearted originalist. <laughs> he admitted sometimes you have to take the edge off. The problem, if you're a super faint-hearted originalist, what type of religious are you? And what's the principle that you're using? And so I do think an originalist has a difficult job of explaining where the line will be drawn. Now one can say, um, whatever you want to call it, a um, devolving constitution or a commitment to an aspirational constitution has a different challenge, which is how do you take those broad majestic phrases and decide what they mean? Does the Equal Protection Clause require that every single public school is funded the same amount? That was an issue the Supreme Court wrestled with the case called San Antonio versus Rodriguez and said, no, that is not what the protection clause requires. So there are going to be judgment calls that have to be made no matter what your methodology is. The challenge for the originalists, are they really willing to go as far as that methodology would require? And if they decide not to, how do they decide why that's where they draw the line? And just to bring us back, Roe versus Wade came not long after the Griswold versus Fed. You had this case involving should contraceptive access be constitutionally protected? And the Supreme Court unanimously said yes, although with a whole bunch of different reasons. Then later, without the decision to have abortion care, is that protected? Now, Justice White, who I also worked for, was in the majority in Griswold, but not in Roe. I believe there's a really good case that if Justice White were alive today and on the court, he might have said, I didn't believe in Roe versus Wade when it was decided. But now that it's become part of the fabric of our law, I wouldn't overrule it. This is that he has started decisively since these things were decided. Part of my confidence for that is Justice White did get to experience the Miranda decision in exactly that light. He dissented in Miranda and said, I would have left more room to the states to figure out how to protect against self incrimination. But by the time we got to the early 90s, Justice White's view is Miranda becomes so well accepted, we couldn't turn it back, and he was comfortable applying for it. I think that's actually where O'Connor was. I think O'Connor might have been a dissenter of Roe versus Wade, but when she looked over the abyss in Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1991, she said, this has become too part, too part of the fabric of American law. We can't overrule it. That type of practical wisdom, the consequential view that you referred to earlier, is missing right now. It wasn't part of the Dallas decision analysis. Ultimately, the court's going to be forced to confront it. Thank you for that. We're getting to the end of our prepared questions. So for those of you who have written down questions, please raise your card, and Selena or somebody else will come around and collect them, and we will try to get through as many questions as possible in the last 15 minutes. Um, while we are collecting the questions, uh, Professor Chatfield, I wanted to go back to you. I mean, People sometimes say, well, the Supreme Court justices have been appointed by elected people, right? The Senate and the President. So therefore, the justices embody uh, public opinion. 
And, uh, could you talk about that argument? Is it logically sound? And if not, what's wrong with it? Thank you. Yeah, this is um, a really interesting one. Professor Adam and I were just having a conversation before about how much our teaching has been changing very rapidly. Um, and when I first started teaching, I would talk about this, right? That, yeah, the court is not elected, they don't stand re-election, but they're appointed by elected branches, and that process can thus help them kind of keep in line with public opinion and bolster legitimacy over time. Um, but as we kind of see things develop, um, I think one of the important factors that um, has become really relevant um, in recent years um, is that neither the president nor the Senate are elected through a one-person, one-vote process, right? With the Electoral College for the President, um, the Senate by design is now apportioned and it's not one person, one vote. And so in practice, a minority of voters can select the President and the Senate that nominate and approve Supreme Court justices and thus widen that gap. Um, and on the current Supreme Court specifically, a third of the justices were nominated by a President who did not win the popular vote. Um, even so, you know, I think a lot of these processes are somewhat obscure to the average American. They're not just thinking about it that way. Um, and of course, none of that is exactly new. But to the extent that the changes in which justices are on the court mean that it ends up drifting further and further from public opinion in its rulings, that does start to impact um, legitimacy. It can get, um, I think, more we Harper, um, that Professor Avial just um, spoke about briefly is going to be an interesting case because it's taking what has always been considered an extremely fringe um, theory, um, saying that state legislators, legislators um, are essentially just uncontrollable, they can do whatever they want. Um, and, and right now we have at least three justices who signal support for that. I, it's going to be a very interesting case to see how that comes out, but my answer would be it depends. But right now I think this is an aspect of the court's legitimacy problems um, that may be influencing that divide between public opinion and how the court's ruling. Thank you. Now turning to some of the audience questions, and I see there's another one up here to be picked up. So this question concerns the role of the Chief Justice, who I think we've gotten used to the Chief Justice, thank you, and of bringing his fellow jurors together so that there's more consensus. Uh, so the question is, has Chief Justice Roberts' role disappeared? What power does he retain? Who wants to feel that one first? I'll start. This is an important point. The Chief Justice's authority is very limited. One vote for justice. The chief justice can assign an opinion if the chief is in the majority. What happened in Dobbs shows that we may not be seeing the Roberts court anymore. He no longer is able to swing the majority. The question then is, can he find Justice Kavanaugh, Gorsuch, Coney Barrett, somebody to join with him as a break on where the rest of the court's willing to go. If he can't, then his authority over the court's direction is quite limited. And that will be a, to my mind, unfortunate development because Roberts is thinking about the court's institutional legitimacy, is thinking about the public's view of the court, and I believe that's worth thinking about. He needs to convince one of the other five to join him. Thank you. Did uh, either Professor Chatfield or Abiel? Okay, great. Um, somebody is asking, uh, one of our audience members would like to hear more about the issues before the court concerning redistricting. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, so, so yeah, there's, there's a lot. Um, <laughs> um, I, I'll, I'll say a little bit about more, which I was kind of just talking about, um, because I think this is an interesting one um, in that it could, although the case itself does not involve Colorado, depending how the court rules, if they do adopt a strong version of this independent state legislature theory, they could eliminate the independent redistricting commission that we have for redistricting here in Colorado, because that was um, brought about by a citizen vote. And according to this theory, even a direct vote of the citizens of the state cannot overrule what a state legislature says it wants to do when it comes to anything involving federal elections. Um, and legislators would be free to violate 
state constitutions, um, votes of the people um, under this type of theory, um, and there wouldn't really be a way to stop that. Um, and so I think that that case is one that's really on my radar as having the potential to have very wide-reaching consequences in terms of how we do redistricting. Um, I don't know if you want to talk about other pieces or examples of. I wish to be at Moore versus Harper yeah. um, is an enormous threat, an enormous threat to the legitimacy and vitality of our elections going forward. Right. So again, just to kind of reiterate what's already been said, the idea in Moore versus Harper that's being advanced and to call it a fringe idea is generous. Um, and, and just, you don't have to take my word for it. There was an amicus brief filed by three extremely prominent originalist uh, scholars who methodically laid out why there is absolutely no foundation from any methodology for this theory. Um, but the, the premise is that state legislatures have virtually unreviewable authority to control elections that they cannot be reviewed by their own state courts, even where state constitutional principles would say, you know, protect access to the ballot, um, and that only the United States Supreme Court really is effectively empowered to, you know, review their work. And so once you take that premise that state legislatures have this, you know, virtually unreviewable authority, and then you combine that with what I was noting before, which is that state legislatures are extremely gerrymandered. Right, so one of the oddities, again, we can use abortion as an example, is even in states like Ohio and Missouri and Texas, fairly reliable polling shows that really strong majorities support reproductive rights in those states. It's actually just the state legislatures are so badly gerrymandered that they're not, like, there's a democracy deficit. Right, so you put all these phenomena together and you have state legislatures in such unreviewable control, not only of gerrymandering, but um, you know, use the 2020 election. A lot of what was happening in um, you know, the uh, election space had to do with like COVID protocols, right? I mean, there's, there are many, many ways that the reliability and um, legitimacy of our elections could be undermined if the independent state legislature doctrine is um, embraced. So that's one that I'm worried about. Merrill versus Milligan um, is the case um, involving the redistricting in Alabama. And that is a um, case that's being litigated under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, which bars election practices um, that result in a denial or abridgment of the right to vote on the um, basis of race. And um, the uh, terminology that you see in these vote violation cases under Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act is cracking and packing. So one of the ways that you can dilute the power of a minority group to have like effective access to the political process is by you know packing too many members of a group into one district. Um, so that there is such an enormous surplus of votes in that district that um, they are those votes aren't doing work in that district and, and they could be doing work in other districts. Um, and then the converse of that, um, so that's packing and cracking is you know, spreading uh, voters from minority groups across so many districts so that they have no um, effective way to you know, combine and, and achieve influence in the political process. Um, and so that's, um, those are the concepts that are at issue in um, the, this uh, case. And, and you know, it's worth noting that the three-judge district panel um, that ruled in favor of the challengers and said, yes, these, you know, the, this is a violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. I mean, two of those judges were appointed by President Trump. So you know, this, is the, this, you know, this is a case in which the commissioners were able to make their case at the district court level in what would not necessarily have been considered a friendly bench. Um, and so to now see the Supreme Court um, being you know, really hostile to those challenges after um, you know, considerable litigation, I think, in, in my mind, is, is noteworthy as well. Thank you. Uh, there's also a question of uh, back to the reproductive rights cases. Uh, if anybody's able to talk about how some cases are being worked up regarding you know, the latest laws banning or severely restricting abortion, and in particular, are any civil rights groups particularly trying to recruit women of color and low-income women since they are the ones who are being disproportionately impacted by these laws? Yeah, I mean, so one of the, the, the um, litigation in the wake of Dobbs is um, taking place under so many different fronts that I would, you know, almost, you know, hesitate to identify a certain trend or to, you know, answer that definitively. But one of the 
things that we're seeing, um, and you know, this is a few that maybe my fellow panelists would also be interested in exploring, is that there's a lot of litigation taking place under state constitutional law. Um, so in a, a lot of states, there is a viable claim that the state constitution protects the right to terminate a pregnancy. Um, and so there's a lot of litigation happening um, in, uh, on, on those grounds right now. Of course, that's going to vary state to state. And so the claims that are going to be effective or the strategies that are going to be effective in one place are not necessarily going to you know, transfer elsewhere. Um, there are um, also, as I mentioned, religious liberty claims, um, First Amendment claims. Um, the, uh, there's a wide consensus that the U.S. Constitution protects the right to travel, but those cases are what you might call really underdeveloped. There's like not a really robust um, set of precedents that help enable us to predict how they would be applied here. Um, and so, you know, let's look a little bit more detail um, on um, some of the litigation that's happening so you can see uh, state constitutional law claims, you can see federal constitutional law claims around the right to travel, and definitely reproductive rights groups um, have consistently been um, working across alliances and have been working to surface for the courts that all of these restrictions have disproportionate impacts on communities of color um, and people who, you know, even when you think about the right to travel, um, there is an assumption there of a certain economic privilege that someone can take time off work, that someone has the funds to go, um, you know, seek an abortion elsewhere. And um, I think that reproductive rights groups have been fairly intentional about wanting to show um, that these uh, impacts are, are really not evenly distributed. That was especially the case in the pre dos litigation, right? So Holm and Cole in the South, um, and, you know, was a case in which the Supreme Court very different Supreme Court struck down um, Texas abortion law, and the um, challengers in that case, in my opinion, had done a great job of showing you know, differential access and how it doesn't impact all communities equally. Thank you. To wrap up, I have a final question for our panelists, starting with A.G. Weiser. Uh, you know, we've been talking about issues at the national level, how the Supreme Court's considering things. Uh, in terms of what is Colorado doing to protect Colorado's rights on these issues, whether it's reproductive rights, voting rights, that sort of thing? So we could have a whole nother conversation. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> Let me try to give you a very quick rundown. On reproductive rights, Colorado passed the Reproductive Health Equity Act, and our governor has an executive order saying that we are going to resist the full extent possible any effort to extradite people who are getting medical care here for doctors providing them. We are committed to protecting the productive freedom in Colorado. And we are really an oasis in the middle of this desert when you look at the states around us. On marriage equality, we depend on the Obergefell decision. We have a state constitutional amendment that says marriage is only between a man and a woman. That is something we need to change in Colorado so that we're not dependent on a Supreme Court decision that is now going to Justice Thomas at risk. On voting rights, Colorado has a system of voting that hopefully you all are participating in. It's safe, easy, secure, makes it as easy as possible to vote. The opposite of voter suppression. Yeah. We also have an independent redistricting commission that is committed to fairness in redistricting, having competitive districts, not extremely gerrymandered ones, and it is now drawn as first districts for state and federal races. We are also continuing to look at how we protect people and that is something that we have a functioning democratic system in Colorado that is not, like I said earlier, subject to an extreme partisan polarization we're seeing elsewhere. We really are a beacon for our nation, and the way we stay it is people staying involved. We can't be complacent. We're living in a time where democracy is facing extraordinary challenges. The answer to those challenges are people getting engaged, working together on behalf of the public. Thank you. Anything to add from our other two panelists? You know, I was just I would just add that you know it's a big part of my legal education to revere the federal courts as protectors of individual rights and liberties, and I still retain some of that. Um, access to courts is a fundamental constitutional value, and our federal courts have a really important role to play. That said, there is no substitute for a robust, vital, engaged, and frankly protective and innovative state law regime. And having elected officials and state courts and state constitutional provisions 
you know, vigorously involved in the protection of individual liberties, I think is part of this new phase that, that we need to be leaning into. Yeah, um, and I'll just really quickly add, I think, um, read a state constitution sometime or start to, uh, because they're enormously different than the federal constitution, which is, I mean, it's very short. I can assign it to students, and they can read the whole thing. And state constitutions are long. They contain a lot of really specific language around rights um, in ways that are just very different um, than what the federal constitution does. Um, and so I agree. I think it does help, um, open up these opportunities if we look at like the earliest cases around same-sex marriage. They were brought under state constitutions um, in many cases as opposed to the federal constitution. So I do think it's an area um, of a lot of opportunity. And I also think um, I was maybe taught to revere courts less than a huge number of courts in political science, but, um, sure. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, also no substitute for people organizing and social movements yeah. and all these other things where we can't always rely on a court to get it done. Um, we can't always trust that that's going to be the place where rights will be protected. Um, and so it's about organizing in other ways. Great. Well, thank you all for your time and expertise.